Matthew chapter 28 and part of verse 6. And our subject this evening is Christ's authority confirmed by his resurrection. And in this verse we read, He is risen as he said. And it's that phrase, as he said, that I want us to focus upon this evening. It may seem such an insignificant phrase, and yet it is rich in meaning and in purpose. A similar phrase is used in Luke chapter 24, when the angel said to the women, remember how he spoke unto you. The women here are being invited to reflect upon the words of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning his own death and resurrection many days before he was arrested and crucified. And the angel really is pointing out that his authority is underlined, confirmed, established because his words came to pass. Well, we begin this evening and I want to speak a word or two to those perhaps who are listening in who would not openly or publicly deny the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you, in a casual way, accept that it probably happened. And yet at the same time, you are not willing to yield your life to the Saviour. You are not ready to take his word seriously, his warnings, his promises and invitations, his commandments. And in one sense, if you are in that condition where you would not openly or perhaps completely dismiss the testimony of the resurrection, and yet at the same time you are unwilling to yield to the Saviour, you are in a very strange position, as I want to show you. Because really, to believe the resurrection at one and the same time is to recognise the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection is significant for many reasons. But we are going to confine ourselves largely this evening to one particular significant reason why the resurrection is important. And that is that it is central. As a central point, it is a powerful endorsement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just consider that this evening because it, in a very mighty and powerful way, confirms the veracity or the truthfulness of everything that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. Imagine those who witnessed the resurrection firsthand. They were transformed from being timid women and cautious disciples fearful into being bold promoters of the kingdom of Christ, fearless in their determination to serve him despite the opposition of the rulers of Jerusalem. And largely, their character was transformed by the very fact that they had witnessed the resurrection. And for them, all that he had declared was now clothed with divine authority. And I would that all of us who are considering these things this evening should come to that same point where we recognize the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got some Ps to help you to focus upon these things. First of all, the pronouncements of Christ. They receive fresh authority through the word, through the resurrection. As he said unto you, everything now is confirmed as true. 
his stated purposes. He pronounced during his earthly ministry that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He declared, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Those words leave a person in no doubt that he claimed to come from heaven. He claimed Almighty God as his Father. He claimed that he was commissioned by the, uh, the authority of heaven itself to teach what he taught, to act as he did, and ultimately to die the death which he voluntarily yielded to. He came to do the will of his Father in heaven. And there were many who challenged him, who questioned him, and said, who gave you this authority to teach and to preach as you do? Many who said, you have no right to assert that God is your Father. Well, that authority was confirmed by his resurrection. The second P concerns his predictions. And they were many. And there are some that still have not been fulfilled, but many that have concerning himself, concerning this world and how it is a decaying world. Despite what men may believe, despite the optimists in society, many perhaps running for cover in the current situation, the Lord could speak about this world gradually running down, evil men growing worse and worse. And Christ, through his apostles, taught that there will be many deceivers and many who will promote evil things in this world in which we live. But Christ foretold the end of the world. Those predictions also concerning his own death and resurrection, they are confirmed, as we shall see, in a moment. Thirdly, his precepts. And what we mean by his precepts are his commandments. Those things which he commends to us that we should do, the way we should live, how we should act, the kind of people we should seek to be. Above all, those precepts guiding us to repentance and to believe upon his name and trust him as the only saviour. They receive fresh authority, as we shall see, through his resurrection. And lastly, his promises. And I include in his promises his invitations, because those invitations that the Lord Jesus Christ issues to lost sinners to come to him, they come confirmed by his resurrection with a heavenly mandate and authority. Can we truly believe that when he invites us as sinners to come to him for salvation, to receive the forgiveness of our sin, and to experience through his gift of the Holy Spirit a new heart and a new life, can we believe that these promises are credible, that they are to be depended upon? His resurrection confirms these things. It clothes those invitations with a heavenly authority. But we must include in those promises the threats, because the threats that he made in one sense are negative promises. They come with confirmation that he, as the almighty Son of God, will execute those threats that he makes during his lifetime. Well, as I said, his resurrection confirms all these things, his pronouncements, his precepts, his predictions, his promises. They all convey to our mind as spoken by he who is risen from the dead. But above all, and this is the crux of the matter, none of those words that he spoke are more significant than his prediction of his own resurrection. There were many things that he said which were revelations, claims, which to many were unbelievable, humanly speaking. 
but surely the most unbelievable of all, humanly speaking. If we just view things from a natural perspective, is his resurrection. And yet he predicted that resurrection long before the event took place. We read, first of all, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time forth, Jesus began to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Notice how scripture just informs us of these things as historical fact. They are not couched in mystical language. They are not set before us in some superstitious manner. It is plain historical fact. This is what he declared. This is what he predicted. And even his enemies, as we see here at the end of Matthew chapter 28, took seriously those predictions that he made. They came to Pilate, the governor, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day. Here were historical steps that were taken by those that hated the Lord to prevent his resurrection, or rather, to prevent what they believed would be a hoax, which would leave, lead many into a deception. They regarded him as a deceiver, but of course they were wrong. Well, there is then in these words here in verse 6, as he said, there are three things that are implied, implicated by this little phrase. And the first is this, it is a rebuke to the disciples, as he said. Yes, it's a gentle rebuke, but it is a real rebuke nonetheless to their lack of faith. They had followed him. They had witnessed his miracles. They had observed him raising Lazarus from the dead. They were convinced that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and yet they could not conceive that after his death he would be raised the third day, even though he spelt it out quite plainly. It was such an incredulous fact that somehow they could not get it into their minds. And there is a gentle rebuke in the words of the angel here to the women, but also to the disciples that they were instructed to report these things to. He is risen as he said. You should not be surprised. You should not be so disconsolate, disciples and women. He is risen just as he foretold. Did you struggle to believe because you could not conceive the magnitude of his prediction? Perhaps that was the case. Because it was, as people say, a prediction that was out of this world, beyond our earthly view of things. And yet it was believable. It should have been believable because he is the Son of God. He is risen indeed, as he said. So first of all, it's a mild rebuke. And though the facts alleged so often seem to be beyond the powers of reason, yet all that the Lord Jesus taught, not simply concerning his resurrection, they come from him who is the Son of God. And as the Apostle Paul wrote at the beginning of his letter to the Romans, he is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. That phrase there, with power, it means in a powerful way. The resurrection 
in the most powerful way possible, says the apostle, declared Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Do you have any doubt? Do you have any suspicions about the plain declaration of the word of God? Then the fact that he was raised from the dead ought to dispel all those doubts, ought to remove all those those misgivings. He is the Son of God and it is declared in a most powerful way that he is such. Then let none of his words be despised or doubted. Secondly, these three words here, as he said, they are an encouragement to our faith. Now perhaps some of us this evening, we, if we are honest with ourselves, we do not have faith. We do not believe the report of Scripture concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not believe that Christianity is the unique testimony of the living God, the word that he has sent as our creator that we may know him and come to experience his love and his grace and ultimately eternal life as his gift. But these three words, they are encourage, they invite our faith. If he is risen, as he said, then surely all that he has said is worthy of our credence. We should believe it because this, the most unbelievable, and I'm using that phrase humanly speaking, this most unbelievable fact has been confirmed has been carried out, and therefore we may believe all that he has said. Firstly, it is right that we should believe, therefore, everything that he said concerning his own death, not simply the certainty of how he would die, taken by wicked hands, nailed to a cross, mocked, scourged, abused, but he declared so plainly during his earthly ministry the very reason why he came to die, to give his life a ransom for many. He would go to Calvary as God's lamb, the sacrifice for sin, and there upon Calvary's cross he would bear in his own body upon that tree the sin and the guilt and all the suffering, the eternal consequences of sin that were due to all his people. He bore them there. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. The sheep needed protecting from a great enemy and he would give his life rather than see the sheep ruined. And of course that enemy is death, justly so. That enemy is the law of God that rightly condemns the sinner, the justice of God that demands our punishment. But Christ gave his life and all the wrath of the almighty God was poured out upon him as our great human representative at Calvary's cross. Can we believe the uh, the genius of the gospel, the divine plan, Christ articulated it as he said, therefore we must believe it because just as his resurrection, as he said, came to pass, then surely it corroborates and confirms all else that he has said concerning the reality of heaven and the eternal world. We find these things because we are earthlings, because we are bound to this world, that we are governed by our physical senses to think of an eternal world beyond this present realm, to think of heaven itself beyond our natural sight. It's difficult. To some it's inconceivable, but so is the resurrection. But Christ spoke of that eternal world to which he would bring his people. He spoke 
of that world which is yet to come. And we must take these things seriously because he said them and all that he has said in so many examples, but especially in the resurrection, has come to pass. He speaks of a bodily resurrection of those who are his people. No more than that. Of all people, whether we know him and love him or not, whether we die as rebels against heaven or not, we shall be raised. Raised and ultimately judged and banished eternally both bodily and spiritually. But the people of God will be raised gloriously and blessedly. Christ has said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, doubtless I will come again and receive you unto myself. He predicted his own return to the earth at the end of the age. Can we believe these things? Well, he rose from the dead as he said. And therefore, we can believe that one day he will return to this earth as he has said. Concerning all the promises of his help in life, what a comfort this is to the child of God. And if you are seeking the Lord, then this should be a great encouragement to you to know the Lord to experience him as not only your saviour, but one who has promised to help you through life. He has foretold that in this world we will know sorrow, we will know tribulation, we will have to experience the consequences of living in a fallen world, a world ruined by sin under the curse of God, but he has said, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Christ is that faithful Lord and Master. And just as he loved his own disciples unto the end, so he has promised that he will be with all those who yield their lives to him, as he said. So there's much to encourage us here. But thirdly, these words, as he said, they are a word of warning to us as well because not only does did he speak on earth with rich promises to those who humble themselves and repent of their sin and come to him and seek forgiveness through his name he also warned of a judgment to come in fact if we turn to the acts of the apostles chapter 17 The Apostle Paul underlines this very fact when he preached to the philosophers at Athens. And as he drew to the end of his sermon, remember, this was a sermon in which he said, I saw an altar that you have with a name, an inscription on it, to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. He said, him declare I unto you. And as he concluded his sermon, he said, But now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance, verification, in that he raised him from the dead. His resurrection is verification. In other words, that Christ, who one day claimed, who claimed whilst here on earth, that as the Son of Man, all men must be brought for judgment. He will be the judge of all the nations, of every human being who has been given life and breath. What a solemn thought. The Lord Jesus Christ, who was risen, triumphant over the grave in order to provide and secure eternal life to as many as would believe in him at the same time. He declared that one day he would be the judge of all that reject his word and his offer of salvation. What a solemn thought then. Jesus Christ is the judge. Can you believe that fact? 
that this man who lived 2,000 years ago, who went about doing good, whose words were life, and whose death and resurrection all glorious, can you believe that one day you will stand before him as your judge? Well, before you dismiss these things, remember he foretold his resurrection as he said. And all that he has said will surely come to pass. And that's confirmed in this very glorious fulfillment of his declaration on the third day, I will rise again. Well, as we reflect then upon these words, I want us to think about their significance for us individually here this evening. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 2 and verse 2 says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? He said, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, what he has said, lest at any time we should let them slip. And that phrase, to let them slip there, it means to let them pass us by. Teenagers that are listening in this evening, you hear these things. Are you content to let the report of Christ's resurrection, the declaration of all that he warned, all that he threatened, all the invitations he gives to your immortal, needy soul, are you prepared to let these things pass you by, to let them slip? How shall you escape, says the apostle, if you neglect these things and carelessly disregard them? We ought to take his word seriously says that writer to the Hebrews, in our hearts we may deny his resurrection. We may say, well, the whole of scripture is fake news. It is a scam, something that I do not believe. Perhaps some of you, you say to your parents, I don't believe these things. Let me urge you to reflect again upon the certainty of all that the scriptures teach. And I want to suggest to you a number of weighty reasons why the record of the resurrection of Christ and the record of all that he taught is conveyed to us with an authority we ought not to despise. Firstly, consider this. The resurrection of Christ was predicted Throughout the Old Testament, many, many times, in many different ways, sometimes there were characters in the Old Testament and their whole lives were a kind of prophecy of the coming of Christ. You think of Joseph and how Joseph, to all intents and purposes, to his family, was dead. He'd gone down into Egypt. His father considered him to be dead. And yet he was raised again to a position of great authority in Egypt and he became the succorer, the nourisher of all his brothers. It was a picture of the coming of Christ and how though he would die, he would become by his resurrection a means of life and deliverance for all that will believe in him. The prophet Isaiah could speak of his days being lengthened, although he would be numbered with the transgressors, although he would be put to death as a criminal, yet the Lord would extend his days. He would be raised from the dead. And there are many other passages. And these things were written, and uh, every evidence is there that these things were written many centuries before the coming of Christ himself. And yet there were hundreds of details of prophecy concerning his life, all meticulously fulfilled in the coming of Christ. If we despise the testimony of Jesus Christ and those things as he said, then we are playing fast and loose with our souls because there is overwhelming evidence 
that his life and his death and his resurrection, his words, his promises, they were the fulfillment of the ancient promises of God through his word, remarkably fulfilled. Then think secondly, before we dismiss these things as a scam, as fake news, of the boldness of the apostles that affirm these things. They were not naturally men of courage and boldness. Think of what they were like when they were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee and the storms came. They were fearful. Think of how when the soldiers came to arrest Christ, they all forsook him and fled. They, they melted away. And yet, within days of his resurrection, such was the conviction with which they were emboldened, that they were fearless, would rather lose their lives, were willing to be imprisoned, to be tortured, rather than deny that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead and so declared both Lord and Christ. This was their testimony and their boldness even made an impression upon the Jewish authorities that opposed them. How much more upon us? Either we make these disciples in our mind's eye the greatest deceivers the world has ever known or we credit their testimony. Which is it to be this evening? Do we say, well, I don't believe these things. In fact, I believe that Christ and his apostles, they were the worst of men, the greatest deceivers. Is that the way we can view scripture? When we think not only of the power and the boldness of their testimony, but also their manner of life. They were men of integrity, of sincerity. They were men of compassion. They were men of holy living. Uh, they had all the hallmarks of being truthful and none of the characteristics of a rogue and a deceiver. But not only the apostles, but many down the centuries have likewise expressed the same boldness of conviction concerning the person and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the time of the Reformation, there were two well-known reformers by the name of Thomas Bilney and Hugh Latimer. Many of you, if not all of us, we will have heard of these names. But Hugh Latimer, son of a wealthy farmer, was training to be a Roman Catholic priest. He had a good mind. He was a man, by all description, who was a force of nature, a, a man of great uh, passion and force in, in, of character. And while studying at Cambridge, he was determined to put down the teaching of Luther and his assistant, Philip Melanchthon, and he went once to preach against these reformers who were claiming the teaching of Scripture with boldness. And it saddened Thomas Bilney, who had already had a personal encounter with Christ through his word, had been convicted of his sin, had come to repentance, and yielded his life to Christ and had found peace and forgiveness. And so after he heard his friend Latimer, speaking with such passionate uh, hatred against the word of God, he went to visit him. And he said, Brother Latimer, will you hear my testimony? Hear my confession? And he did. And as he heard the testimony of Thomas Bilney, he was convinced. And he began to study the scriptures for himself. And he preached Christ. And latterly, he would exclaim that he was once that obstinate papist. But now he was willing to give his life for what he knew to be true because he had experienced the power of the resurrection of Christ in his own heart. Well, we must draw to a conclusion. 
this evening. Where do you stand with regard to Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he was the Son of God? Do you believe the testimony of Scripture that describes in plain historical terms not only his death but his resurrection? Or are you somewhat doubtful and cynical about these things? Remember the angels. When he rose from the dead, they reported to the women, he is risen as he said. Christ's words are certain. And through his resurrection, they are authoritative. We ought never to take them lightly. We ought to realize these things are so true. They invite our trust. They bid us come to the Savior. But they also warn us that if we reject him, then one day he will appear as our judge. Well, may the Lord bless us and cause us to believe the very truths that are reported in Scripture. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. We realize that when he was here upon earth, many were astonished at his teaching. They were drawn to his words as one that had authority, not as the scribes. And yet there were others that doubted. And yet, surely, through his resurrection, all that he said must have been brought to the minds of multitudes with fresh authority. Here are the words of him declared to be the Son of God in a powerful way by his resurrection from the dead. Help us to sense the certainty of these things, for we live in days of unbelief. We live in days when so many dismiss these things as being irrelevant. Help us to see their certainty. And may we trust our souls to the only Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, that we might be received by God. We ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Let's conclude this evening by singing together 275. <laughs>